Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Am I on? There I'm on. Good morning and uh, welcome to Valley Presbyterian Church. It is impressive to get so many folks out here to do some theology early, quite early on a Saturday morning. Welcome to Valley members and welcome to visitors who we consider at Valley potential friends. Thank you for coming out today. This is the second in three seminars that we're offering on the topics of marriage, sexuality, and leadership. And so you can, you can access our first one online. If you go to the Valley Presbyterian Church website, you can just Google Valley Presbyterian Church and get there. And today's seminar and tomorrow's seminar will also uh, be, be posted online if you're not able to uh, attend tomorrow. So I encourage you to do that. Speaking of tomorrow, uh, Reverend Ron Hawkins from Horizon Church will be one of our presenters, and the other will be uh, Reverend Dr. Vernon Myers. Uh, he's a United Methodist Church uh, pastor and also a writer and founder of the Arizona Center for Theological Studies. So we're looking forward to uh, tomorrow as well. For our own congregation, our feedback and listening sessions with our uh, session leadership are continuing tomorrow morning in the library if you haven't had a chance to take advantage of those uh, opportunities. I want to acknowledge our committee that includes Gloria and Ed and Mary and Lisa and Ron. Could those folks stand up for me? Let's give those folks a round of applause. We are blessed today to have uh, two folks who have traveled some distance. Um, to my left is um, Dr. Kirk, and Dr. Daniel Kirk has come from San Francisco, and to my right is Dr. Gagnon, and Dr. Gagnon has come all the way from the holy state of Pennsylvania, my birth state. <laughs> He's come from, uh, come from Pittsburgh uh, today. It's, uh, it's amazing to, to, to be willing to leave uh, their wives, and each of them has two children to come out to a, a church they've never uh, talked to, a place they've never been, to, uh, to share their understanding with us today, and that's at considerable sacrifice of their time. Very blessed to have them, and we found out that we had connections. Last night I got to have two dinners, first uh, with Dr. Kirk, then with Dr. Gagnon, and because uh, their planes were arriving at, at different times, and I discovered as uh, chatting to, uh, to Dr. Kirk that he, his doctoral degree was from uh, that wonderful place out East Duke University, he was a blue devil, which is a little odd for a theologian, I think, name-wise, but he got to know someone at his church who was on the faculty who was in youth group in middle school and high school and college with me called Dr. Peter Fever, and they, they got to be friends out there. And then I found out from Dr. Gagnon that his office was next to Scott Sunquist's. Uh, Scott is the PCUSA's leading expert on, on missions and ecumenics. And uh, Scott and I were fellows in the doctoral program at Princeton and led the doctoral fellowship group together. So we found out that we had mutual friends. Isn't it amazing? I wonder if you would join me in giving these two gentlemen a welcome and a round of applause today. We begin uh, all of our gatherings with prayer here at Valley Presbyterian Church. Let's uh, join our hearts and our minds in prayer today. Heavenly Father, is it possible to have disagreement without becoming disagreeable? Can we contend without being contentious? Can we respect each other and our differences without giving in and embracing relativism? Is it possible to wrestle publicly with hard issues without vilifying folks who are on the other side of those issues. Can we speak the truth in love? Heavenly Father, we pray today that the answer to all those questions is yes, but we know we can only speak the truth in love if we are guided by your Spirit. Only so if we can humbly wrestle with the truth of your Word. We can only speak the truth in love if we're determined to walk that narrow way that leads to life, and only if we find our unity in both your grace and your truth and our place in your worldwide mission of restoration and renewal. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to bless each person who comes today. Help us to grow as people and as disciples. And we ask this in your son's precious and wonderful name and all God's people said. Amen. Moderator, Ed Glady. Good morning, I also echo David's uh, 
congratulations for being here. I know I, I wanted to watch college football this morning, and so I'm here. At, uh, hopefully, uh, 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 some of those games will still be on this afternoon when, the, when we go home. Um, as the first session, how many here were here at the first session? Good, most of you. All right. So the, the format is the same today, 30 minutes uh, for each speaker, and then 10 minutes uh, for a second round uh, for each speaker. Um, as some of you probably remember, our speak, one of our speakers last time uh, ignored the timekeeper down here. She kept looking left or right. So we've modified it a bit today. Uh, I'm now on stage. Mary is now our timekeeper. And when she holds up a card that says, done, if the speaker is not finished, I'm going to stand up from my seat and stand right here next to the speaker to give them a, just a bit of a, a, a visual hint that it's time to be finished. Uh, we'd like very much to have you out uh, close to noon. Uh, you've been given three by five cards. Uh, just like the first session, um, if there's a question that comes to your mind um, that a speaker, based on something a speaker said, fill out a question or more than one question, we'll take a break after the second round of 10-minute uh, uh, talks. Uh, we'll collect the cards. Please don't get up. Um, we have some folks who will stand up and collect your cards. Once you get your card collected, then, then you can uh, use the restroom, whatever. We want it to be a short break, five or 10 minutes at most, just because, we, again, we want to be out relatively on time. Um, and uh, I ask, as I did last time, if you uh, agree or disagree with the speaker, don't cheer or don't boo during the speaker's presentation. You're certainly welcome to applaud at the end of the speaker's presentation. Um, but we're here for listening and discernment and uh, just a, a quiet time with our hearts as we hear our two speakers. I've met both of them. They're both delightful people. They're also very intelligent. I can't wait to hear what they have to say. Um, as in the first session, we flipped a coin to see who got first, go first, and uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Kirk was the winner of that coin flip, so he gets to go first, so we have Dr. Kirk for 30 minutes. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to say first might come as a little bit of a surprise, especially since there are two New Testament scholars sitting on stage, but... I am not here to talk about what the Bible says about same-sex relationships. The reason I'm not going to talk about it is because I think that it's fairly clear, and in fact, in the large contours of that discussion, Professor Gagnon and I essentially agree. We agree that the Bible speaks with one voice in the Old Testament and New Testament and the places where it speaks about same-sex relations. It condemns those relations as inappropriate for the people of God. So the question that I'm going to be asking today and wrestling with is not the question, what does the Bible say about that issue? The question that I'm going to invite us into and to provide a framework for is, what sort of biblical guidance do we have for loving the gay, lesbian, transgender, queer, bisexual people who are in our midst? What does it look like for us as the people of God to make known to these sisters, brothers, and other siblings of ours that they as well as us are members of the family of God? You see, the reason why we're having this conversation isn't because the Bible got complicated all of a sudden. The reason we're having this conversation is because our lives got complicated by a new reality that we have become aware of. And the question before us is, what do we do with this? Um, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Jesus Have I Loved But Paul. And in that book, I discussed the question of homosexuality. And I suggested this paradigm for including and embracing gay, lesbians, bisexual people as part of our communities on equal footing as everyone else. That framework, that biblical framework is the work that God and the early church did to include Gentiles within the people of God. So that is the framework that I'm going to use today in order to argue that we should be fully affirming and embracing as equal the LGBTQ people who are part of us. But before I get into the meat of that, uh, I want to say a couple of things uh, at the beginning. One of them is, um, if you are an LGBTQ uh, person who is listening to this either in the room or on the video sometime later, you hear a lot of things, and you might hear a lot of things today. Um, but the most important thing that I hope you hear today is that God loves you 
that you are a beloved child of God in Christ. You have the same spirit that cries out, Abba, Father, as any straight person who loves God. So please know you're a beloved child of God. Second preliminary remark is uh, a little bit by way of an apology. Uh, I'm aware that at the first conversation that was had, there were two straight white people talking about this issue, and here we are, two straight white men talking about this issue. And if we are going to love you, our LGBTQ sisters and brothers, we have to know you, and to know you, we have to listen to you. So thank you for your grace and patience as we fumble through figuring out what loving you looks like, and um, even if this moment perhaps um, could have been a little bit better uh, in that in that regard. The third thing I want to say preliminarily is just to, again, LGBTQ people who might be here or watching or who are part of the church, thank you for still being here. I honestly don't understand why, after the way the church has thought about you and talked about you for 2,000 years, you still feel so drawn to follow Jesus that you want to be here and be part. But thank you um, for that and for honoring us with your presence. So, you're here. And for the rest of us, it's not them and us. It's all of us together. We are all together the people of God. And this is what the church was wrestling with in the first century when Gentiles came into their midst. In Acts chapter 10, Paul, uh, Peter goes to visit a centurion named Cornelius. And while he's preaching, the spirit falls on these people. And Peter says, how can we deny them baptism by water when God has baptized these people by the Spirit. And there was another group there that said, no, this is the circumcision party. And they wanted them to be circumcised before they could be baptized, before they could be brought in. But the church said, no, God has accepted them. And so we have to accept them in the same way that God did. We can't force them to become like us before they're part of the people of God. Paul makes a similar argument in Galatians 3 where he says, you Galatians, you've already received the Spirit. So why do you think that you have to become Jewish in order to fully be part of the people of God? About two years ago, I had a lengthy conversation with one of my senior colleagues at Fuller uh, about this issue, and he's uh, a traditionalist on it. And in the course of an hour, he must have used the phrase, my gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, no less than a dozen times. And what struck me is when you say that phrase, when you say my gay and lesbian sisters and brothers, you are making a confession about the identity of the people of God that Paul probably would never have made. We, have, we are acknowledging that our gay and lesbian sisters and brothers have received the spirit of adoption. They are our baptized children as well. So what I want to do now is run through what did it mean for the church to receive Gentiles as they were without them having to become Jewish? And in particular, what did this mean in terms of what Scripture had said before? And how did the church have to reimagine what Scripture taught based on the experience of the Spirit of God being at work in their midst? There are three big things that being Jewish would have meant for these Gentiles. They would have had to be circumcised, they would have had to keep food laws, and they would have had to keep Sabbath. So let's run through those together. Circumcision, first of all. all right, this stuff is so distant to us. The fact that we don't have to do it is so obvious uh, that I kind of want to problematize it for us. So starting with circumcision. When God makes the covenant of circumcision with Abraham, God says to Abraham, this is a covenant of circumcision that is in your flesh forever. He says, any foreigner that wants to join up in your house, any Gentile who wants to be part of the Abrahamic covenant is going to have to be circumcised. And anyone who's not circumcised is going to be cut off. We might say excommunicated from the people of God. In addition, the whole point of the Abrahamic covenant was to provide a way for humanity's creation blessings to come to fruition. God says to Abraham, I'm going to make you fruitful and multiply you, and kings will come from you. Go back to Genesis 1. You're going to be fruitful and multiply and rule over the earth forever. The marker of foreigners who have been joined. If you weren't circumcised, you were to be excommunicated because this is how God is going to see to it that his creation purposes were fulfilled. And then... 
after Gentiles received the Spirit without being circumcised, Paul says, well, you know that Abraham thing? God said he was righteous before he was circumcised. So, before he was circumcised. So, Abraham gets to be the father of everyone. He gets to be the father of those who are his children who believe even without being circumcised. A new reading of Scripture in light of what the Spirit of God had done in the midst of the people. A new reading of Scripture in light of a transformation in the identity of the people of God. And this is what we're going to see repeatedly as we go through the New Testament narrative is it's not just the law of God that we have to get inside of so that we faithfully live out our Christian identity. The identity of the people itself starts to shape what sort of things we have to do what our ethics are in order to continue faithfully marking ourselves out as the people of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says that those who had been effeminate and homosexuals have been washed of that. He says that those people, along with a host of others, will not inherit the kingdom of God. What do we do when we're sitting in a place where our washed and sanctified and justified sisters and brothers are still effeminate and homosexual? What do we do in this moment where we call them sister and brother and thereby confess together that they in Christ with us are in fact heirs of the coming kingdom of God? To be Gentile and not Jewish meant you didn't have to be circumcised. It meant you didn't have to keep food laws. Now, I think that some of us have it in our heads that food laws were some sort of Jewish tradition that sort of grew up around the laws that really mattered. But let's not make any mistake. uh, Leviticus 11, which begins a whole host of food laws, says, God spoke to Moses and to Aaron. And in Deuteronomy, when the food laws are reiterated, God says, this is, these are the laws for the people of the Lord so that you won't be like those other people. It's, they are laws that mark out Israel as God's faithful people. And perhaps with these food laws, there's also an echo of creation, of the Garden of Eden. The food laws were Israel's way of getting right what Adam and Eve got wrong in the garden when God said, you shall not eat, and Adam and Eve disobeyed. This is Israel's opportunity to get it right. And then, back to Acts 10. Peter is taking a nap. He has a vision. He has a dream. And in this dream, a sheet comes down from heaven with all these unclean, creepy, crawly creatures on it. And a voice from heaven says to him, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter says, no, Lord, no unclean thing has ever passed my lips. And the voice from heaven says to him, what I have made pure, do not you profane. What I have made pure. Notice God did not say... This stuff has never been impure before. Wake up. He says, I've purified it now. What's going on in this vision is two things at the same time. First, these animals are a representation of the unclean Gentiles that God is just about to purify through Peter's sermon. So when Peter ends up in the house of a centurion, he says, you know it's not lawful for us Jews to have intercourse with Gentiles. This word for interaction that I've translated intercourse, it's the same word that Paul will use in 1 Corinthians 6 to talk about being joined to a prostitute and being joined to the body of Christ. Peter says it's unlawful for us, but God has shown me not to call unclean any person. But then it's also on the literal level of food as the people who go back and try to rat Peter out say he went to Gentiles, and he even ate with them. When God purified the Gentiles, it was no longer okay for God's people to say, you are still an impure Gentile people, and you have to be marked out by the purity laws that have always marked us out as well. It was not okay to say they have to keep these food laws Is it simply coincidence 
that Leviticus 18, the chapter in which we get the whole litany of prohibitions about sexuality, begins with God saying, don't do like the Egyptians do, and don't do like the people of the land of Canaan that I'm giving to you. The laws about sexuality in Leviticus 18 had among their purposes to distinguish the Jewish people from their Gentile neighbors. What's the standing of these laws as such when God has said, no, I'm not interested in distinguishing my people from the Gentiles. I'm interested in purifying the Gentiles as they are and letting them be part of the people of God. Why is it that we don't make a big deal about men and women having sex during a woman's period? Another law from Leviticus 18. Might these laws provide some of that same cordoning off of Israel from the Gentiles? And might that be how sexual intercourse reserved for heterosexuals is supposed to function as well? Now, in order for this to work, in order for us to say that inclusion of our LGBTQ sisters and brothers is parallel to the inclusion of the Gentiles. We have to grant that sexual identity and having an identity as a sexual minority is a viable thing. And this is something that a lot of us have trouble with, and I've had trouble with it for a long time. Isn't the idea that you have a gay identity or a sexual identity at all just the product of the sexual revolution of the 1960s? We as a church... We as the church for a long time have said that in order to be part of us, you may not be a practicing gay or lesbian. Do you know what that means? That means that we, the traditional conservative church, we made sexuality an identity marker by saying this has to be your sexual identity or practice in order to be part of us. Can we then turn to the group that we have excluded and say, you can't use it as an identity marker when we realize that identity markers of our society are not to be the markers of the people of God. See, when we are in a position of being the the majority group slash the group in power, we often don't realize how much our, whatever it is that makes us the majority, is part of our identity. But then, for instance, we start talking with our African-American friends, and all of a sudden we realize that it's not just that things are, it's that things are white. And what we're learning by talking to our gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer brothers and sisters is that things aren't just the way they are. Things are heterosexual. They are based on heterosexual normativity. We don't realize as straight people that when we're watching a movie, we are drawn to the attractive actor or actress of the opposite sex. That's just normal. They end up coupling with the person that seems normal. That's not normal for some of our sisters and brothers. You see, sexuality is larger than what we do with our penises and what we do with our vaginas. Sexuality impacts all of the ways that we react to other people. I have a friend who tells a story uh, of an uncle of his. His uncle uh, had a temporary job giving people IQ tests. So he started playing a game. He started guessing people's IQs before they came in to take their tests. He was shocked to find that in his assignment of numbers, he gave attractive women 20 points higher on average than what they tested on the exam. Just a little picture that even when we're not looking for a sexual partner, and even when we're not engaged in a sexual act, we are still sexual people, and that sexuality is deeply influencing the things that we say and do. Is our continuing to marginalize gay and lesbian people in, who are part of us, is that our continuing to say, you are unclean to those whom God has purified? To be Gentile meant you didn't have to get circumcised. 
you didn't have to keep food laws, and you didn't have to keep Sabbath. What does Sabbath have to do with anything? Well, this is why Sabbath is important for me, and we'll, we'll lay this out. I'm a New Testament scholar. I care about what the Bible says. My biggest hang-up and the thing that kept me being open and affirming longest was the simple fact that homosexuality is depicted as sinful in Scripture. It's listed in vice lists with other sins that I still don't want people to commit, and the committing of which I think marks people out as not faithfully functioning members of the body of Christ. Could sin itself and our understanding of sin really be transformed along with the transformation and the identity of the people of God? Sabbath. Sabbath keeping begins with creation. It is part of the order of creation. God himself rests on the seventh day, building in this rhythm into the natural order of the world. If heterosexuality has a claim on creation, Sabbath has an equal claim. Sabbath is a law that is given not just in some passage in Leviticus, which none of us have ever read except that we're debating homosexuality. Sabbath is a law that is given in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, spoken by God's own mouth to Israel, written with God's own finger in stone for God's people. Breaking of Sabbath was so serious that it was a capital crime. You get killed for breaking the Sabbath, according to Exodus. But the importance of Sabbath and its significance as this beacon of faithfulness to God. It's not just about creation. It's not just about the Ten Commandments, which, by the way, as Presbyterians, a a large part of the tradition is that the Ten Commandments are the epitome of the moral law of God. It's not just finding its significance in the fact that it was a capital crime. Sabbath-keeping is also part of Isaiah's vision for the future eschatological future people of God eunuchs who are going to join themselves to the people of God who are willing to keep Sabbath will be embraced within the people of God. That's Isaiah looking to the future. Foreigners, Gentiles who will be willing to keep Sabbath, Isaiah says, will be embraced within the people of God. Israel, when they will call the Sabbath a delight, will be part of the people of God. So, when we open up our New Testaments and Paul says to the Galatians, I'm afraid for you. If you keep Sabbath days and new moon festivals and annual festivals, I fear that I have labored over you in vain. Keeping Sabbath now makes Paul worry that they're not actually trusting the gospel anymore. In Colossians, Paul, or the writer, says, don't let anyone be your judge in regard to a Sabbath or a new moon or a festival day. And Paul in Romans says, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Let each person be fully convinced in their own mind. The definition of sin has changed because God has embraced Gentiles into the people of God. Keeping Sabbath became so much a Jewish identity marker that for Gentiles to come in as Gentiles, it meant they could not be held accountable for keeping even one of the Ten Commandments. The definition of sin changes when God changes the composition of the people. And this is why Peter and Paul, they had this interchange that Paul talks about in Galatians. In Galatians 2, Paul says to Peter, Peter, we're Jews by nature, not Gentile sinners. That's Paul speaking out of the Jewish stereotype. To be holy, to be righteous meant that you're Jewish. You're within the sphere that's demarcated by keeping the law of God. And to be outside of that, by definition, meant that you were a sinner. 
But Paul says, look, we've trusted in Christ now. We don't look to the law for our righteousness, so stop telling other people they have to. Okay, Paul, so are you saying that Christ is now a minister of sin, that we can go and do all this sinful stuff and Christ has freed us to do it? Paul says, no, that's not the point at all. You see, the way that I would be a sinner now would be, he says, if I rebuild what I once destroyed. In other words, if I now require Gentiles to do all this Jewish law-keeping stuff, that's how I would prove myself to be a transgressor or a Gentile, I mean, uh, or a sinner. So what you're saying is, it used to be that falling outside of this realm that was protected by law made you a sinner. Now what makes you a sinner is requiring people to get in. The definition of sin has been turned on its head because God has brought, in a surprising way, this additional people to be part of the community. But the other thing that this means, we have to realize, is not that Christ is a servant of sin. Just as the Spirit of God, just as the Spirit of God marks people out as God's faithful people and the church is responding to that, Paul also points to the Spirit and says, what does righteous living look like? It looks like keeping in step with the Spirit, walking by the Spirit. It looks like love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we can still say there is a sexual ethic for the people of God. Recognizing that gays and lesbians are part of our community doesn't mean we have to surrender all of our sexual ethics. We can invite them with us to the cross-shaped loving of partners, which is a lifetime of committed relationship as the arena for same-sex interaction. There are ethics that remain for us, and I would say that that ethic of keeping sex within a lifelong covenanted partnership is an ethic that still distinguishes us from the world around us that has no interest in sexuality as part of an ongoing morality beyond um, certain deployments of power. You see what's happened, what the church has realized with the embrace of the Gentiles, with God giving the Spirit to the Gentiles. The church realized that to accept the Gentiles among them was not actually the church deciding to accept them into their number. It is the church acknowledging that God has already accepted them into their number. And the church is simply agreeing with God. To say that they are sister and brother and have the spirit is to say that God has adopted them as God's own, as they are. And so Paul says in Galatians, there is no longer Jew or Greek. We have this shared identity in Christ where that distinction doesn't tell us apart. Then he says, there's no longer male and female The first thing he probably means is it's not just the men that carry around the covenant marker anymore. Circumcision doesn't mark out the people of God. But it is interesting that Paul chooses to echo the language of Genesis. Paul doesn't say neither male nor female. He says no longer male and female, that original pair that God created. You see, we don't know what life is supposed to look like in new creation until God shows us. We can't simply draw straight lines from old creation to new creation and say we need to um, repristinate what was there before. We have to learn what God is doing now and respond appropriately. What I'm saying is this, that God is doing something now. That to say we have gay and lesbian, bisexual sisters, brothers, and other siblings is to say God is giving his spirit in a way that we have to see, recognize, and respond to. God is doing this now in the 21st century. It's the time that was given to us. The flip side of that coin is this isn't what God did in the first century. And I might wish, as somebody who's now open and affirming, that God had done so, so that the New Testament evidence might be more explicit. 
But I would also say it was no more wrong for Paul to be a first century Jew than it's wrong for us to be 21st century Christians. But it might be wrong for us to continue saying the things that Paul had to say as a first century Jew. And it might be wrong for us to say even the things that Jesus probably thought as a first century Jew because it was not in their day that the church was given the gift and the responsibility of responding to the fact that there are gay and lesbian sisters and brothers, children of God, right here alongside us as they are. And so my argument for inclusion is not that there's some um, mysterious exegetical jiggery-pokery we can do to make the New Testament not say what it seems to say, although I think there are some interesting things to explore in that. It's the argument from the work of the Spirit of God, that we, no less than the first century church, have an obligation, a biblical obligation, not just to say what the first century writers said, but to do what they did, to exercise this great leap step of faith that when God has so acted, we must respond. That loving our gay and lesbian sisters and brothers means in every way creating environments where they hear, you are just as beloved sister, brother, sibling, child of God as I am. And so that we don't make the fatal mistake of separating in our body what God has joined together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirk. I think, Russ, do you have to do make a push a button someplace? So we got a 30-second filler here. Um, just so you know, we, the session is still listening to you every Sunday morning from 9 till 11.30 in the library uh, through the month of October. And we have another session tomorrow um, after lunch. So uh, I think it's at 1 o'clock tomorrow. I think that's right. So go to service, have a nice lunch, come back, and we'll... Uh, 1.30, come back, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, do this again. Let Russ run down the stairs real fast and go back down there and um, pick up from there. Come on, Russ, run. There he is. Are we good? Okay. So uh, our second speaker for the next 30 minutes is uh, Robert, Dr. Robert Gagnon. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here in Arizona, my second time in my lifetime of 57 years, and uh, still a great place, just as it was many years ago, seven or eight years ago. Love the temperature. That's ta- a New England boy talking there for you. All right, we're going to cover some, I'm going to use some slides as a facilitating help here to giving a presentation. I'd like to start with a little saying by Augustus, which I, Augustine, which I think uh, sets the stage well here for what the meaning of love is. I'm looking at the last portion of what's up there. Do not imagine that you then love your son when you do not give him discipline, or that you then love your neighbor when you do not rebuke him. This is not love, but mere feebleness, weakness, laziness, Let love be fervent to correct, to amend. Love not in the person, his error, but the person. For the person God made, the error the person himself made. And that is a critical distinction when talking about love. You love the person not the error that the person commits. You can, and as a Christian must, make that distinction. So sometimes what will not appear to be love to someone because they want to engage in behavior consistent with innate desires is nonetheless, in fact, love. Central message of Jesus, according to Mark, summary of Jesus' message, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. 
Repent means turning away from a whole host of behaviors. Jesus defines discipleship as taking up your cross, losing your life, denying yourself, and then coming to follow him. That doesn't sound like you get to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, with whom you want to do it with. And so radical is the call to discipleship that nothing less than the metaphor of death is used. So if you derive from that, that the God of Jesus basically arrives on the scene to validate our innate urges, that's a very different picture of discipleship than the one that we actually find in the Gospels. What I'm going to argue here uh, is not merely that Scripture is clear about a male-female requirement for sexual relations, which automatically infers a prohibition of same-sex erotic unions, but it is a core value of Scripture. How would you define a core value? Certainly a value that is pervasively held across both Testaments, even when it's not mentioned explicitly, it's being presumed. This is certainly the case for homosexual practice. Every law, proverb, narrative, piece of poetry, metaphor that has anything to do with sexual ethics in the Hebrew Bible always, without any exception, presupposes a male-female requirement, part of the very fabric of the discussion of sexual ethics throughout a whole of Scripture, even when not explicitly mentioned. Absolutely held value, by which I mean uh, no exceptions are ever provided. Even with regard to incest, the patriarchs do certain things that are subsequently closed off, loopholes that are closed off in Levitical incest law. As you know, polygamy is closed off implicitly by Jesus' remarks and subsequently by rabbis. There's never any loophole about homosexual practice in Scripture, and that's because it's right at the foundation of sexual ethics from Genesis 1 on. Strongly held, meaning that this regard a particularly severe offense when you violate it. A value that's held in opposition to prevailing cultural trends here in the context of the ancient Near East and in the Greco-Roman Mediterranean basin, and a value that's been held in the church for two millennia. Any one of those notions would qualify something to be a core value, but here we have all five in place with respect to the issue of a male-female requirement for sexual unions. So we're not dealing with merely a tangential issue in Scripture. My case would be that we're dealing with a central area of Scripture, in fact, a foundational matter of sexual ethics. Now, it's often said that Jesus said nothing about this issue. The silence of the Lamb, cinematic echo there. Key Jesus sex text is in Mark 10 with parallel in Matthew 19. You know, Jesus is being asked about divorce and remarriage because that's a debate between two rabbinic houses at the time, House of Hillel and the House of Shammai. And they're trying to catch Jesus into a trap. Instead, Jesus goes beyond the trap because he, he doesn't negotiate simply between the House of Shammai and the House of Hillel, but draws a conclusion which he extrapolates from an appeal to creation. Jesus said to them, with a view to your hardness of heart, he wrote to you this command. I want you to focus on that for a second. Yes, Jesus is talking about change here. But I want you to know the direction in which the change is moving. Not towards greater license in sexual ethics. Not to ignoring a male-female requirement in sexual ethics. But actually a more rigorous application of that requirement now to close the remaining loopholes that have existed in the Mosaic law, where Jesus now renders that law more internally self-consistent and coherent. But from the beginning of creation, which incidentally, according to Jesus, trumps Moses, male and female he made them. Now, he could have cited the whole of Genesis 127. Instead, he cites simply one-third of that verse. And then back to back with it, Genesis 2.24, which starts with for this reason as a way of saying the reason is found in Genesis 1.27. It's precisely because God intentionally, as the creator, designed us as a complementary sexual pair, male and female, that a man may leave his father and mother and become joined or attached to his wife and the two become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What then God has yoked together, 
let no man, let no human being separate. Now, what is Jesus doing there? Why even appeal to these two texts in Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24? Why just the one-third of Genesis 1.27? There's not a lot of verse there. Okay, the only thing in common between these two texts is, is the notion that there's a male-female, man-woman requirement for sexual unions. In other words, what Jesus is arguing is that he's limiting the number of partners now allowable in a sexual union based on the duality of the sexes intentionally designed as such by God in creation. That is the duality of number that Jesus is now insisting upon, whether at any one time, concurrently, polygamy, or serially in a revolving door of divorce and remarriage for any cause. He said, that is, when it gets beyond two now, that's not going to be allowed anymore among my followers because God deliberately designed us as a sexual pair, male and female. The duality of the sex becomes the foundation upon which Jesus extrapolates a principle about monogamy, about the duality of number allowable in a sexual union. So if you think it's important, monogamy is an important thing, you don't want to revert back to polygamy, specifically polygyny in ancient Israel, multiple Uh, Husbands were allowed multiple wives. Uh, Women were never allowed multiple husbands. They were always bound by a monogamy requirement. Um, If you don't want to move back to that point of time, then you need to go back to the foundation that Jesus established for eliminating that excess beyond a duality of number. Unless we think that this has no relevance for the issue of homosexual practice or that issue, let's delve back a little further into it. Now, Jesus, again, here is emphasizing the two-ness of the sexual bond. You know, in the uh, Genesis 2.24 text in the Hebrew Bible, it doesn't say the two shall become one flesh. It just says they shall become one flesh. The two appears later in all the versional evidence. The Vulgate, the Samaritan uh, Pentateuch, the Aramaic Targums, the Septuagint, etc. All of those versions, other translations, began in placing in that text the two shall become one flesh because they understood the logic of what was being said in Genesis. And if we can trust the uh, gospel writers, Jesus said the two as well, which would have been by that point in time traditional. Again, he prohibits both the revolving door of divorce and remarriage and and implicitly polygamy. Again, more specifically polygyny. Uh, The main scholars who worked on the divorce remarriage text Uh, David Instone Brewer, William Loder, myself, and others all agree that Jesus was implicitly taking in polygamy here. How do we know that? Which is easier to prohibit, polygamy or remarriage after divorce? Which do we prohibit in our society? Polygamy. Much harder to prohibit remarriage after divorce because that's more of a serial form of polygamy, not concurrent polygamy and Allegedly, at least, you have dismissed your previous spouse, so you could argue, well, it's really not a third party, although Jesus didn't agree with that viewpoint. Again, where does Jesus get the number two? Look at a parallel text that was written about 100 years before Jesus spoke by the Essenes in a document called the Damascus Covenant. The Essenes are associated with the Qumran scrolls and a very rigorous group Uh, of observers of the Mosaic law in early Judaism. They forbade members of their community from taking two wives in their lives because, quote, the foundation of creation is male and female. He created them. The same one-third of Genesis 127, Jesus would cite a century later. And because those who entered Noah's Ark went in two by two. Why do they draw on that line? Well, they went in the ark male and female, two by two. That phrase, male and female, in Hebrew is a kar una keva. You might think appears all over the Hebrew Bible, but it doesn't. It's basically limited to Genesis 1.27, Genesis 5, 1 to 2, which is introducing a genealogy and restating Genesis 1.27. And otherwise, only in the Noah's Ark narratives, where clearly it's glossed with a self-contained duality or two-ness that there's an implication about number resonant in the duality of the sexes. In other words, the two-ness of the sexes, the duality of the sexes, 
is the basis for the two-ness of the sexual bond, the duality of number. Now, we know from Qumran on other discoveries, the Temple Scroll and so forth, that they did not prohibit, likely to have prohibited remarriage after divorce. They did use this, however, to prohibit polygamy among their members. What Jesus did is he simply went further than they did and prohibited something even more difficult than what they prohibited. Now, if you say, well, Dr. Gagnon's biased, we know his position, he's just you know, reading the text in a way he wants to read this. Well, let's look at somebody, for example, like William Loder, who's published a very good work, the New Testament on sexuality, over 500 pages, about 70 pages are devoted to the issue of homosexuality, in which I'm his key dialogue partner. Loder is strongly supportive of homosexual unions. He's an Australian New Testament scholar, um, he's very well published. He's published about eight or nine books on sexual ethics and early Judaism and Christianity, more than anyone else who has ever lived to this point. Very well researched, very well footnoted, and I, I noted to you, strongly supportive of homosexual unions. And yet, he's honest about Jesus and Jesus' view. For example, in one of his works, he notes that for Jesus, one flesh referred to a singleness of being and reflects the idea that male and female originally belong together, and that sexual intercourse in some way not only joins, but rejoins the male and female to one. Jesus' statements in Mark 10, Matthew 19, clearly exclude sexual relations beyond that union. That is beyond the union between a man and a woman, including same-sex intercourse. Nothing indicates that Jesus would have approached the prohibitions of Leviticus any differently than his Jewish contemporaries. Why did Jesus not speak directly against homosexual practice? For the obvious reason that the Hebrew scriptures were very clear about the matter. No Jew is advocating homosexual practice, much less engaging in it, at least not known to be. No, and uh, so consequently, for Jesus to have spent time saying, don't have sex with persons of the same sex, would have been a complete waste of time. Instead, he took the remaining loopholes that existed in the law of Moses with regard to sexual ethics, applied rigorously a male-female foundation, and then closed those loopholes. Sexual ethics for Jesus was a life and death matter. According to him, you could go to hell for it, for acting with sexual impurity. When he talks to the woman caught in adultery, he says, go and from now on no longer be sinning. We know what the follow-up to that is in John 5.14, which uses the same expression, and then follows it up with, lest something worse happen to you. And in that context, the something worse that happens to you is not inheriting eternal life. That's what's at stake here, according to Jesus. Jesus coupled a heightened ethical demand with a loving and forgiving outreach to the very violators of that demand. He did not reduce the demand. This is true in his outreach to tax collectors who were known to be exploitative in the use of material possessions, collecting several times more than they were supposed to collect, and his outreach to sexual sinners. Nobody would argue that because he reached out to exploitative tax collectors that he was soft in economic exploitation. On the contrary, he was well within the prophetic trajectory in his critique of the abuse of material wealth. Jesus reached out to them because the tax collectors were at greatest risk of not inheriting the very kingdom of God he proclaimed unless they repented. And it was the exact same reach, reason for the outreach to sexual sinners. Unless they repented of egregious sexual sin, they, like the tax collectors, would not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus in the love commandment, citing love your neighbor as yourself is the second greatest commandment. What's the context for that? Well, it's very clear. The verse and a half immediately preceding. You shall not hate, take revenge, or hold a grudge against your neighbor. And if your neighbor does wrong, you shall reprove your neighbor, lest you incur guilt for failing to warn them. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Reproving somebody and calling them to repentance and a transformed life is not the antithesis of love, but in fact part of it. We know that because Jesus himself appealed to that in Luke 17, where he says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him, even if he sins up to seven times a day. We're to have a certain holy gullibility, if you will, with respect to accepting the genuineness of a confession of repentance, even after some ridiculous number of violations. 
But what we cannot be allowed to do is allow people not to repent and then assure them that everything is fine, because it's not. Again, the center of Jesus' message, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. When we look at the Genesis text to which Jesus appealed, we find a very close connection between God creating the human in his image and their creation as male and female. Now, obviously, the animals, too, are created as male and female, but that is not integrated into being made in the image of God. We have a lovely dog, Benji, who's a Morky, part Maltese, part Yorkie, mostly Yorkie because he barks a lot. And, uh, you know, I never derived my sexual ethics from Benji. He's not very discriminating, I found, when it came to sexual purity matters. But that's okay. He's a dog. God doesn't hold him responsible. God does hold me responsible because I'm made in God's image. And this text is a way of saying what you do sexually can mar, can efface, or enhance, if you're obedient, uh, that image that's stamped on your being. And make no mistake about it here, that use of the expression, male and female, zakah unakeva, always refers to a sexual pair. It doesn't just mean men and women equally are made in God's image. It does mean that too. But it also makes a connection about sexuality in which the foundation is God created us male and female. In Genesis 2, it talks about God making a helper for the Adam or human as his counterpart. Uh, and then God, and then the Adam slept and God took one of his sides, which I think is a better rendering than ribs since the term selah, selahim in the plural, is used all 36 other times in the Hebrew Bible for side. And all but one of those occasions is the side of a piece of sacral architecture. The Ark of the Covenant, the Solomonic Temple, the Tabernacle, the Eschatological Temple in Ezekiel. And it's a way of saying that human beings in their sexuality are de designed by God as sacral architecture. What you do sexually matters. Just as Paul talks about our bodies being a temple of the Holy Spirit, in 1 Corinthians 6, in the context of discussing the incestuous man who's in an adult consensual relationship with his stepmother, but violating natural law in the process. And we know what Paul's verdict on that is. Paul says, no, what you got, you've been bought with a price, especially in terms of your sexual being. God wants to own you. You do not belong to yourself. You belong to God. You better glorify God in your body sexually. Very important thing to be known. Uh, and as you know, uh, God closed up the flesh, and Yahweh God built the side that he had taken from the Adam into a woman and brought her to the Adam. And he said, this at last is bone for my bones. No misogyny here, by the way. And this is flesh for my flesh. So this one shall be given the name woman, Isha, for from man this one was taken. Therefore, an Ish shall leave his father and mother, a man, and uh, become attached, joined, stuck, united to his woman or wife. And they, or the two, shall become one flesh. What is the meaning of the term konegdo, uh, helper as his counterpart, as his counterpart? Term here that's behind that is neged, which means both corresponding to and opposite to. It's a perfect chosen term here because male and female correspond to one, one another as humans, but are opposite or different in terms of their sexes. Counterpart or complement, good rendering of that. You can't fake sexual complementarity as though an effeminate male can play the role of a female, or a masculinized woman play the role of a male. It's not accidental that in Genesis 2, 21 to 23, it repeatedly emphasizes that something was taken or extracted from the Adam, the human, who then, after that extraction, is identified as a gender-specific man, an ish. Why the repeated fourfold emphasis something is taken from the Adam? Because what is missing from the human, now an ish, now a man, is that part that God builds into a woman. Man and woman are then viewed as two essential complementary parts of a holistic picture of human sexuality. One flesh in that context doesn't merely mean the same family. It means restoring the missing part to an original sexual whole. In other words, the image of one flesh becoming two sexes grounds the principle of two sexes becoming one flesh. When we look at the Gentile inclusion analogy that some people argue should be a means for us to dismiss the biblical witness on this issue, the problem with that is there really isn't a lot that connects these two issues, uh, inclusion of Gentiles and affirmation of homosexual practice. The inclusion of Gentiles, well, the Bible uh, does not uh, 
uh, ground circumcision in creation. It does ground a two-sex prerequisite in creation. Circumcision is a Jewish ritual pres prescription that's enjoined only on proselytes and affecting the body only superficially. Homosexual practice is a universal moral proscription enjoined on all Gentiles and affecting the body holistically. Gentile inclusion is about welcoming persons. Homosexual practice is about accepting behaviors. In Scripture, being a Gentile is only incidentally linked to sin. Uh, in Scripture, homosexual practice is intrinsically connected to sin. Gentile inclusion, well, there's significant Old Testament precedent for this and uniform New Testament support. Homosexual practice has total rejection in both New Testament and Old Testament. Being a Gentile is about this ethnicity, which is 100% heritable, absolutely immutable, primarily non-behavioral, and therefore inherently benign. Homosexual orientation is an impulse that's not 100% heritable, although I do believe there are biological influences. It's open to at least some degree of limited change, even the Kinsey Institute agrees with that, and it's primarily a behavioral condition. It's a desire to do something, which is structurally discordant with the way in which we've been created, and therefore not benign. Now, when Paul talks about the issue of homosexual practice, and I'm going to have to go more quickly here because of time, he clearly has a creation echo in the background. You can see this come out in Genesis 1, 24, 26 to 27, Romans 1, 23 to 1, 27, where you have eight points of correspondence in a similar tripartite structure between a small set of verses each. This is what scholars call intertextuality. You don't have to cite a, a text explicitly. You can create an echo chamber of meaning of allusions to Old Testament texts by a series of connections with a short section of text. What Paul is saying here, I'm not only looking at how well or badly homosexual practice is done in the ancient world, I'm looking at what God's will for us is in creation, actually appealing to one of the central texts that Jesus appealed to for defining sexual ethics. He also makes an argument from nature that the truth about God is visible and apparent in the material structures of creation. So you have to deliberately override it suppress the truth that's been made available to you in order to engage in that sort of behavior. And he connects up with both idolatry and same-sex intercourse, not limiting his indictment of homosexual practice only to idolatrous forms, but saying both of these are classic examples where human beings have to deliberately suppress the truth about God accessible to them in the material structures of creation. That in terms of our gendered bodies, anatomy, physiology, and psychology, it's clear that the appropriate counterpart to a man is a woman and a woman is a man. And to deny that, it requires an act of suppression of the obvious truth which God gives us. Uh, Paul also indicts lesbianism on that. If you want more information about that, ask me at the question time. To indict lesbianism is important because lesbian, lesbianism in antiquity is not conducted in particularly exploitative fashion with callboys, with slaves, or with prostitutes. Uh, mutual gratification, not coercion, is expressed in this text. Males are inflamed with the yearning for one another. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. I'm probably going to have to skip over most of this for now. Maybe we'll get to that later. Just suffice it to say, the terms that are applied, like arsenokoitai, uh, come from a larger Jewish milieu in which they all recognize that the only acceptable form of sexual behavior uh, is between a man and a woman. The conception of carrying homoerotic unions already existed in the ancient world. I hear tell that you've heard that they didn't know about committed unions in the ancient world. Uh, scholars in biblical studies and classics know that to be false. If you hear a theologian say it, he simply hasn't done his homework. Uh, you can look, for example, in Plato's Symposium, where arguments are made about the loving unions of members of the same sex who want to be joined for life in a consensual, committed union. You can look at second century romances, which also involve equal age pairings, tragic love stories of male lovers, which involve no exploitation whatsoever. You can look about things going on in Rome uh, and Alexandria, where they have references to semi-official marriages taking place between persons of the same sex. You have debates in antiquity between proponents of man male love and proponents of male female love 
where the proponents of man-male love don't argue, hey, we got exploitative relationships or promiscuous relationships. Quite the contrary. They argue that their relationships are far more loving and committed than heterosexual relationships. Series of other texts about lesbian marriages even in antiquity, including in Alexandria, where the church father Clement of Alexandria comments on such relationships and still calls them contrary to nature, even though obviously they're committed relationships between members of the same sex. Uh, I thought uh, Daniel was going to talk about the misogyny argument. He didn't, so I'm going to skip over that right now for the most part and probably bring that up in the other time. Orientation arguments also existed in the ancient world. You'll hear people say they didn't know about uh, innate influences on homosexual development in the ancient world. That is a false statement. It's an empirically false statement because you can simply look up a series of texts in the ancient world where they do posit some degree of congenital influence on at least some forms of homosexual development and still reject them as Paul would reject them because I don't know about you, but I got lots of innate urges to do things God doesn't want me to do. And the fact that I have those innate urges and was born with those urges doesn't mean that I'm entitled to engage in behavior consistent with those urges. That's why the metaphor, again, that both Jesus and Paul uses is that of death, putting to death those innate desires. God is intending to recreate us in the image of Jesus, despite whatever innate urges we experience. Thomas K. Hubbard, a classicist in the University of Texas, Austin, wrote a major source book on basic documents about homosexuality in Greece and Rome. He says, oh yeah, they had something akin to sexual orientation in antiquity. Here's a classics expert on the subject. Bernadette Bruton, a self-identified lesbian scholar who wrote a 500-page book for University of Chicago Press on lesbianism in antiquity, with 150 pages on Romans 126 alone, acknowledges that they had some awareness of sexual orientation in antiquity, and it wouldn't have made any difference. What is the problem with homosexual practice in Scripture? It's self-deception, conceiving a sexual same as a sexual other, when in fact it's a sexual, when in fact, a sexual same can't be a sexual complement to oneself, but treating that sexual same as though that person were. It's sexual dishonor, treating one's maleness or femaleness as only half intact, not in relation to the other sex that exists, that would be true, but in relation to your own sex, as though two half males make a whole male or two half females make a whole female. The beauty of another sex union is when a man and a woman, male and a female, unite, the two halves of the sexual spectrum merge where the third party becomes neither necessary nor desirable. It's sexual narcissism because it's arousal for the distinctive features of one's own sex. And it's sexual harm because when you put two men together or two women together, the extremes of a given sex are not moderated and the gaps are not filled. That's why we have special problems that pertain to homosexual male relationships and homosexual female relationships that differ according to gender type. If it were purely simply a matter of societal homophobia, then the problems would be exactly the same among both groups, but they don't. In fact, they're quite predictable based on male-female differences. Higher numbers of sex partners for males, uh, higher rates of sexually transmitted infection, women lower longevity of relationships, higher incidence of mental health problems. All this confirms uh, the wisdom of the biblical witness. And I do have to stop there, and thank you for your time. I get the impression we could be here all day. We have some, two very bright, bright men up here who have lots of things to tell us. Um, so the second round is 10 minutes apiece. Uh, they're allowed to speak on whatever they'd like to speak on. And after those two 10-minute sessions, we'll take a break. So um, if you want need to get up and take a break now, feel free. But um, we'll take a break. It, it, we're, we're, this is not a formal break. We're going to take a formal break in 20 minutes. But uh, I can see some people squirming. So if you have to go right now, it's fine. So uh, we'll ask Daniel to come back up, and he's have 10 minutes. Oh, man. Um, where to start? Well, uh, I actually, um, I'm actually heartened that we both started in the same place, uh, which is the question, uh, setting the stage is the question, how do we love our, uh, our gay neighbor uh, as herself? And the, the quote from Augustine underscored the importance of us being willing to uh, rebuke people who are in the wrong. This is what uh, love of our children looks like. It's what love of our, um, of our sisters and brothers in this community is going to look like as well. Um, Professor Gagnon also brought up in that context 
Jesus' call to discipleship and to take up our cross and follow. And in fact, when I'm wrestling with the question of what love looks like, I often go to the cross. I'm actually really nervous about arguments around love because love is one of those words that uh, we can... We can deploy self-serving meanings of um, quite easily, and um, it's, it's kind of ironic because at the heart of it, love is supposed to be the selfless act, um, but um, it, it, can, it is amenable to selfish, selfish definitions. But Scripture gives us a, a, quite a robust, specifically Christian definition of love, and it begins with, God is love, and this is how we know what love is. God gave his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. God so loved the world, he gave his son. And the son so loved the world that he gave himself. Uh, Jesus tells us, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. The cross does, in fact, show us what love looks like within the Christian narrative. So one of the questions that I put to myself on a regular basis and a question that I encourage my students to put to themselves uh, on a regular basis, and in fact, I encourage us as the church, whenever we're making significant or insignificant decisions, uh, to ask about love is this. Our definition of love is the love of the Jesus story, who Christ who is crucified. So what's happening right now? Am I playing the part in this story of the self-giving love so that my neighbor can live? Or am I trying to get life for myself, for my people, even if it means taking the life of my neighbor? It's very strong language. Um, It helps my definition of love be a little less self-serving. But it also helps bring things uh, to the ground and to catch me in ways where I might call love things that are actually self-serving. And this is uh, ways that our our world often works. So uh, this is the, the challenge that I wrestle with and kind of my growing discomfort with Um, the traditional position that I held until quite recently, actually, uh, was as I'm thinking about the story and I'm telling gay and lesbian people that you need to remain celibate um, or marry somebody the opposite gender, it seemed to me that I was playing the part of the centurion, that rather than summoning them to faithfully respond to how Christ was calling them to take up their cross, I was putting a cross on them that I was unwilling and unable to bear myself not being called to celibacy um, and unwilling to take up that particular cross. Um, And so what is my job? Uh, My job is to bear my own cross and helping my um, everybody, sister and brother and other, thrive in either the singleness or the lifetime committed relationship, which is its own cross bearing to which God has called them. Another thing about love, love the sinner, hate the sin is destructive to gay and lesbian people. Sexuality is not just about what we're doing with our penises and our vaginas when we're being physically intimate with somebody. Sexuality is about all of the attractions and repulsions that we feel toward people as we go through every day. And when we say that this is a sinful orientation producing sinful actions, this creates a situation in which literally every time somebody's walking down the street and sees another face, they're confronted with the voice in the back of their head that may be whispering to them, you are shameful in the sight of God because you just thought of that person that way. You thought that woman was beautiful. That's a highlight of you being shameful in the sight of God. You thought that man was attractive, and you're supposed to think women are attractive. You are shameful in the sight of God. At the end um, of his presentation, Professor Gagnon made allusion to the life, the destructive life that often um, our gay and lesbian friends, neighbors, sisters, and brothers find themselves in. The mental health issues and the rampant sexuality and the STIs, these are not the result of simply 
being willing to act on gay attraction. These are the results of us saying to them, you are shameful, you are less because of these feelings that you have. It's hearing the message that this makes you less and that disintegration of yourself that causes people to try to find the centeredness and the wholeness and the completion through these means of acting out. The church has had its chance to show that calling people to a lifelong of celibacy actually results in greater health for not just gays and lesbians in the church, but for our society as a whole. And it hasn't worked. It is interesting that the key Jesus sex text is this passage on divorce. And Ultimately, I don't disagree with the conclusion that Jesus did not approve of same-sex relationships for the same reasons that were outlined. He's a Jew talking to Jews, and it wasn't an issue. We find out about issues when Jesus disagreed with his contemporaries. Okay? But I do think it's ironic that this is the place we have to come to to establish Jesus' firm, significant, unbendable, unflexible status toward same-sex relationships, because this is where Jesus is talking about divorce. Our churches have gradually come to realize that sometimes divorce is necessary. There is even uh, a trajectory, perhaps in the New Testament, toward softening the divorce requirements. Most of us are not in churches that would forbid somebody to be on the session or to even be ordained because they're divorced. So we're being asked to take this passage as establishing a firm, timeless principle, drawing a conclusion that Jesus himself did not draw in this text, even while we gradually let go of the specific conclusion that Jesus did draw and drew from his position on Genesis 2. That should not be lost on us. And maybe it should make us wonder, is it perhaps not how firmly rooted this is in creation, but maybe our own presuppositions about what's okay and what's not that's determining how we read this text? In light of Genesis 2 and this debate Jesus has here with the Pharisees, I imagine a modern Jesus being confronted with this question. Jesus Is it lawful for this man to be married to his husband? To which Jesus responds, what do you see in scripture? What does it say there? And they say, it's written, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And Jesus said, yes, but before this, it was written, it is not good for the man to be alone. The problem that God has solved, do not you recreate. Genesis 2 is tricky. When Adam sees the woman, he's recognizing somebody who's enough like him to be his partner. What's being contrasted is not the woman versus a man. What's being contrasted is there were all these animals and none of them were Adam's helper. And then God brings a human and says, this is my flesh and bone. It's kinship language. This is somebody who's enough like me to be my partner. The arguments about nature are tricky. In Genesis 1, I mean, in Romans 1, Paul says that men having sex with each other is against nature, that they're so enthralled and they pursue. Could anything that's against nature be acceptable to God? To return to my overarching metaphor, those Gentiles, those Gentiles are wild olive trees, and God has grafted them contrary to nature into the cultivated olive tree that is Israel. It might be perhaps that the very nature of the gospel is undoing of what would seem to be nature for the new nature, which is the new creation of God.
Thank you, Dr. Kirk. Okay, Dr. Agagdon, you got 10 minutes. I wish I didn't write like a doctor. I have to make sense of my notes here. Jesus, uh, what we're dismissing here, we have to understand, it's not an ancillary argument Jesus is making. Jesus is regarding the male-female, found, male-female prerequisite for sexual unions as foundational for all sexual ethics. He actually extrapolates a principle about monogamy, limiting the number of persons in a sexual union to two on that basis. In effect, he's saying this is even more, the foundation is even more important than the principle extracted from it. How are you going to extract a principle about monogamy when you eliminate the foundation from which that principle is extracted? How are you going to make monogamy more important than the very foundation which predicates the principle for monogamy, without which you cannot develop the principle of monogamy according to Jesus? We're not just dismissing a sorry. To me, I marvel at the ease with which we're able to, with one fell swoop, dismiss the entire witness of Scripture and what Jesus regarded as essential for sexual ethics, and yet we still call him Lord. That's absolutely extraordinary to me. I don't see how that can be done. Love the sinner and hate the sin. How can that be a bad thing? That's the epitome of Jesus' entire message. It's why he reaches out in love to the tax collectors and the sexual sinners. He doesn't love what they do. He loves them. And his job is to reclaim them for the kingdom, which requires repentance from that behavior. Uh, Dr. Kirk just said, you know, the stuff about the high numbers of sex partners, sexually transmitted infection, etc., is simply due to societal homophobia. Well, if that were true, then homosexual males and homosexual females would experience the same problems at the same rate, but they don't. Is it really, it's really not rocket science to say that men find monogamy more difficult than women. They've done federally funded cross-cultural studies interviewing 20,000 people around the world. I'm thinking one particular one here in 2013. First world, third world, industrial societies, tribal societies, they came to the astounding conclusion that men find monogamy more difficult than women, to which I say, what would we do without experts? These are your tax dollars working hard for you. It's not exactly hard to figure out when you put two men together in a sexual union, this is not a recipe normally for monogamy, nor is it for sexual health. This incidence of sexually transmitted infections are much higher than what we find in lesbian relationships for all the obvious reasons. I hope, hope I don't have to get into an anatomy lesson here. Uh, in women, uh, shorter-term unions on average, simply because they invest more of themselves in the relationship, which is good, except when you don't have moder- anybody moderating an extreme, that is, regarding things that aren't that important as really important, and everything is very important, puts extraordinary, extraordinary stress on the relationship that leads to higher relational breakup. Um, love. <laughs> yeah, love is a great thing. Uh, how do you apply love to an adult consensual incestuous relationship? It's self, it can be self-giving. A polyamorous relationship between consenting adults can be self-giving. Why don't we validate that? Because there, are, because there are certain structural, embodied, formal requirements to sexual unions that don't attend to generic love. Jesus tells us to love everybody with whom we come into contact, even an enemy but he doesn't tell us to have sex with everybody with whom we come into contact. There are special commands with regard to sexual ethics that transcend simply questions about whether you're self-giving. And if you are, you're in a sexual union where you're treating your sex as only half intact in relation to your own sex, in Paul's language, you're dishonoring the person that God made you to be. And that cannot be allowed by the church if we are, in fact, to love. Divorce. Sure, we've made some concessions on divorce and remarriage. What I want to ask is, do we want to be more internally, we want to be more consistently disobedient to the will of God expressed by Jesus? I would rather us improve in the divorce marriage spectrum and start talking about more, as Jesus did, about this lifelong commitment that takes place in the case of marriage. If you thought that the only alternative you had uh, to uh, remaining in marriage was to be single for the rest of your life, I can guarantee you there'd be a lot fewer divorces. And that's exactly what Jesus is advocating. So I prefer, instead of being more consistently disobedient to Jesus, to try to be more consistently obedient to Jesus. Moreover, the divorce remarriage is extrapolated. His point about that is extrapolated from a foundation. Everybody knows the foundation is more important than any principle extrapolated secondarily from it. 
I've never heard a person argue that because we've accommodated to divorce and remarriage, therefore we should now accommodate to polygamy. Well, actually, I, I am now hearing people argue that, actually. Uh, but we don't want to argue that because you can make that same sort of argument there. You wouldn't make that argument because everybody knows polygamy is worse than remarriage after divorce. Everybody knows that incest is worse than remarriage after divorce, even when it's adult consensual. So to allow some degree of accommodation on a lesser matter does not entitle any degree of accommodation on a greater matter. There are many other arguments can be give there, given there, but ask the question if you want more. Um, called to celibacy. We're called to obedience and purity. And for a lot of people, far more heterosexuals than those who identify as homosexual. Uh, they, they are remaining faithful in their life. I know a number of persons. I have a number of friends who have been single. They're in their 40s. They're in their 50s. They're in their 60s. They did want to get married, but they could only, they could only do so by compromising certain ethical standards that Jesus had put in place for them. And they chose instead not to do that. Is that their preference to remain single? No. But it is their preference to remain obedient to Jesus. And that is something that's incumbent on everybody. You will not die if you don't have sex. I can tell you that. You won't die if you won't have sex. Sex is not like food. And by the way, uh, although the connection was made that sex is like food laws, actually both Jesus and Paul rejected that comparison. Jesus said, don't compare the desires you have from within to do what God doesn't want you to do with ingesting food. And in that vice list, he includes three sexual offenses, adultery, and then he uses generic terms about sexual immorality and sexual impurity, sexual licentiousness. And he says, if you try to fulfill those desires, which are not really ritual commands, but moral issues, then you defile the body in a holistic way. Don't make that comparison with food laws. Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, whatever relevance there is between, sex, between food and idols, he discussed that in the idol meat question in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, uh, there's no comparison with sex. Sex is not like food. Sex is something that holistically controls your being. God wants to be in control of that. And God has very clear standards for sexual purity. So he said to the Corinthians, don't make that comparison. Galatians 3.28 was cited by Dr. Kirk, neither male and female. Uh, scholars like William Loder, thoroughly supportive of homosexual unions, acknowledges, he has a whole large section on Galatians 3.28 in one of his works. Uh, Galatians 3.28 is not about eliminating a male-female requirement for sexual ethics, as Dr. Loder notes. On the contrary, it's simply about the equal worth of man and woman in Christ before God. But if you want to actually apply it to sex, a consistent application, both by those who have been called heretics in the church, the Gnostics before them, some of the Corinthians uh, that Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians, after them, church fathers, all of them agreed on the point. You want to apply neither male and female to sexual ethics, you know what it means? No sex. And Paul merely holds that element in abeyance until such time as we have resurrection bodies. Leviticus 18 was discussed. I don't know why the parallels to incest, adultery, and bestiality weren't mentioned. But the fact that we're not to be like the Canaanites, according to that text, or in other words, to be like unbelievers, those who are not like the people of God, is not grounds for dismissing those requirements. The only thing that Dr. Kirk did mention was menstrual law, but it, it's interesting that when Leviticus, the sex laws in Leviticus 18 are given in Leviticus 20 and reordered according to, to degree of the offense, menstrual law is put in a second, not first degree tier of sexual offense, unlike homosexual practice, bestiality, adultery, and sex with your parent or child. Moreover, elsewhere in Leviticus, it's regarded as a purely ritual offense, not a moral offense. And the New Testament doesn't even pick it up. The New Testament does pick up, however, on incest and adultery and implicitly on bestiality. And those things haven't changed. And those are the closest parallels. In fact, incest is the closest parallel to the issue of homosexual practice because you're having sex with somebody is too much of a same on the level of kinship. Even though it can be conducted as an adult, consensual, committed union involving self-giving and mutuality and reciprocity, it's wrong because you haven't met the embodied requirements for the sexual union. You're too much the same or like to that person who is a close kin. That sameness is felt even more intensely as regards the issue of homosexual practice because sex or gender is a more essential element of sexual intercourse than is kinship. That's why incest law develops subsequent to Genesis. You have to develop the population first 
before you make distinctions about marriage to somebody who's too close a kin. But the issue of a male-female requirement is clearly ensconced in creation. To say in Genesis, as Dr. Kirk implied, that the withdrawing or extracting something from the Adam has nothing to do with the meaning of one flesh is extraordinary. You can look at other ancient Near Eastern creation texts, and they don't talk about a female or being being extracted from one and thereby rejoining the two subsequently. That's unique to, to uh, ancient Israelite understanding of origins and something to be maintained. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a short break. If you have a question on a card, we have, who's, our, who's collecting our cards? All right, uh, Lisa is back here. Uh, Mary, uh, Gloria, if you have a card, you want to give it to them, feel free. Let's take 10 minutes, please, no more than 10 minutes. We'll come back and have our speakers discuss your questions. Okay, we can take our seats. Man, you guys are good. At the men's, at the men's breakfast, I have to say that about six times to get guys to shut up. So thank you for being so obedient uh, here. Um, so I was given, you guys were wonderful with your questions. I, I can't possibly ask all the questions. You should know that the questions from last time and this time and tomorrow I'm collecting. Um, and we may try and use those in a larger context. I just, it's, it's about quarter to 12 and I want to be here for the next three hours of the questions. But you, you asked some delightful questions. I really thank you uh, for the questions. So I've picked out a few that I think are representative, and I want both uh, the speakers to address these questions. Um, these are my choices, so if you're mad that I didn't pick your question, you can be mad at me uh, uh, for not picking it. But I'd like to have the speakers just kind of address both of these questions, and uh, we'll give them each about two minutes, and then we'll go on. So uh, let's just... Uh, 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 the, both speakers allowed me to call them by their first name, by the way. So I'm going to call Rob and Daniel uh, instead of the more formal doctor uh, or professor. Uh, so Rob, I'll ask you this question first, and Daniel can answer second. Um, do you feel that engaging in a homosexual, active homosexual relationship can be eligible to be ordained as an elder or deacon? Should I go up? Well, you can stand there. That's fine. However, is your mic, why don't you stand up? Is, your mic, is, is his mic on? Why don't you stand up over here? It just will make it easier. Uh, no, I hope it's clear from everything I said that that would not be possible. Just as a person who's involved in an active adult consensual incestuous relationship would not be allowed. Just as a person who is in, involved in an active consensual polyamorous relationship would be allowed, not be allowed to be ordained. Because such persons, according to um, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, and certainly implied in other places, are at great risk of not inheriting the kingdom of God. And when you think of the case of the incestuous man in 1 Corinthians 5, which is the closest parallel, what's Paul's reaction to the incestuous man? The Corinthians pride themselves in their ability to tolerate that relationship. Paul says you become inflated with pride and arrogance over your ability to tolerate. You know what you should have been doing instead? You should have been mourning. Why? Where do you mourn? You mourn at a funeral. That person, is at, that offender, is at high risk of being excluded from the kingdom. I love him, Paul says, more than you do, and I love him enough to be able to say this, that there must be temporary remedial discipline to hopefully bring him back into the community of faith, because everything is at risk for him, and if he doesn't come back, he is likely to be excluded. Now, that's not passing judgment in any sort of negative way. That's simply applying the standards that Jesus and God give us in the witness of Scripture. You judge when you give, when you exonerate somebody, when you give somebody a pass for a form of behavior that God and Christ do not give a pass to. You can just as much judge doing that as you can making up a condemnation that God or Jesus don't give. So we actually must simply reiterate the witness of God and Jesus in Scripture. If, if my children, when they were young, were going to touch a hot stove, and I said, there, there, knock yourself out and experiment, you know that state social services would not regard that as love? They regard that as parental abuse. And they will take the children out of the home. Because I do nothing while they're engaged in behavior injurious to themselves. I don't warn them. 
It's not love in the church when you don't warn persons engaged in behavior injurious to themselves and others. Uh, in my view, uh, uh, somebody who is involved in a, uh, a same-sex relationship would not be automatically discluded, uh, excluded from leadership for that purpose. As I've tried to indicate, I think that our understanding of what constitutes sexual sin is being sort of reworked, uh, even by God's Spirit. Um, however, uh, I, what I would say is that I'm in agreement that adultery and porneia, um, and there is such a thing as sexual sin, and that those are significant things for us to weigh uh, in these conversations and uh, assessing whether somebody's sex life uh, is such that it would be pleasing to God or not. So I would you know, want to see evidence that people are in, if they are uh, expressing of a a gay identity that if they're if they're sexually active that they're active with somebody that they are in a lifetime um, covenanted uh, relationship with um, so I would basically want to hold them to the same sorts of standards that I would hold my um, my heterosexual friends to okay stand up there you you get the next question first <laughs> with all the problems in the world do you really think Jesus cares about this issue Yes, I do. Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because I, I do think that sex is important. And our sexuality is a significant component to who we are, um, a way that we not only express ourselves, but that we uh, experience some of the mystery of being joined to another that is somehow um, an echo of Christ's love for the church. So I think our sexuality is very important, and Jesus cares. Uh, I think Jesus cares um, because Jesus cares how his sisters and brothers are treating each other. And that this, these conversations that we're having are, uh, are dividing the church. And in Jesus' great prayer, he anticipates that the world is going to know that we're his disciples because we love one another and because we have the same unity among ourselves that he shares in with his Father. Um, and we have not handled this situation, this controversy, in such a way as to promote unity in the church. We've handled it in such a way that we are splitting and dividing as we are so prone to do. So I think that there is a lot in the honor of Christ and his name that we all bear and in God's concern for our flourishing as people that matters in this, uh, in this conversation. Thank you. Dr. Gagnon? Wow, to have that question asked makes me feel like, gee, I am the world's worst communicator. Because I think I pretty clearly showed that Jesus regarded as found a male-female requirement as foundational for sexual ethics. That Jesus said that if your hand or foot should threaten, eye or foot should threaten your downfall, cut it off, because it's better to go into heaven maimed than to be thrown into hell full-bodied. And he said that in the context of discussing sexual purity issues. Paul, whenever he dealt with his converts, first thing he dealt with them was with the issue of idolatry. And after that was squared away, what was issue number two for Paul in all his letters? Where he recounts what he told them previously, sexual purity. Number two, why, where do we get this notion that this isn't important? You see how much society devotes itself to getting sex? The way it wants to have it? We're obsessed with it? It grabs us holistically. It affects the whole being, such that Paul can even give the example of a man having sex with a prostitute, which you think would just be a commercial exchange of funds and would have no investment of the person's life. But he says, even when you do that, you become one flesh with the person. While you're joined to Jesus in one spirit, you're now going to take this body in a holistic way and join it in an immoral sexual union with another. And you think that that doesn't matter to God? Would you want to substitute in that question you know, why would God, there's so many problems in the world. Why get worked up about the fact that a man is sleeping with his sister and it's a consensual adult relationship? Why get worried about the fact that, the, that uh, you have a, a, a thruple here or you have five persons where they're all having sex with one another on a regular basis? They're committed, they're loving, they're consensual. What is the big deal? Stop getting so hung up on the tired old principle of monogamy. But I don't hear people make those kinds of statements because they would be laughed at if they made them. This is more serious still. We have leapfrogged over the issue of polyamory and adult consensual incest to approve something that in Scripture is regarded as a more foundational violation 
than even those two. We're now going to have to go back and do a mopping up operation and now be more consistently disobedient to the will of God. If you think that homosexual practice makes no difference, I don't know why you're not promoting polyamory in the church. You ought to be, because the basis for limiting the number of two persons in a sexual union to two is the duality of the sexes, which you now say doesn't make any difference, despite the fact that Jesus called it foundational. If Jesus is that wrong about sexual ethics, something that he regarded as the very foundation of sexual ethics and sexual purity. If he is wrong about that, I don't know why you even bother listening to him. Because he then ceases to be your Lord in any meaningful sense. Either when he means it, and he bucks the entire culture when he says it, he means business, and this is central, and we get with the program, or stop with the pretense that somehow Jesus is our Lord. Can I stay back up or you got another question? <laughs> Waiting to exhale. How can our church be true to Scripture and love the LGBT community? In the same way that we're true to Scripture and love all the rest of us who are constantly struggling with impulses to do that God doesn't want us to do. Right? Which one of us here? I, well, let me just talk about myself. I do. I struggle with an array of desires to do things that God doesn't want me to do. I'm greedy. I'm arrogant. I am covetous. I am envious. I am jealous. I have sexually immoral desires. And I would be very embarrassed to admit that if not for the fact that you all have the same thing too. So how do I want people to treat me? Just ask yourself that question. Now, when I'm going through a difficulty in life, and I have gone through difficulties in life, I've gone through difficulties in my life where I've actually come to God and said, I don't feel in this or that area of my life that you really care for me. Now, of course, I feel stupid when I say it, because, oh, yeah, you sent Jesus to die on the cross to save me from my sins in order that you could mess up my life, right? This doesn't make any sense, right? So then I have to renew my mind in accordance with the core gospel and change the way I think change the way I think about myself in relation to God, change the way I think about myself in relation to others. And when I have difficulties, I don't want somebody lording it over me, claiming, you know, I got no problems, I'm better than you. I want somebody who has a little bit of an introspective conscience. They're aware that they too have sins. They humbly come alongside me, not as somebody to nail me, beat me up, treat me badly, but as a friend. A friend who has the courage to tell me things that I may not be willing to admit to myself but to do it in a loving way, a gracious way. And even if I fail subsequently, that they are gracious again. Okay, no problem. Jesus is extraordinarily gracious. Sin seven times a day, you say you repent, you can be forgiven. Sin 70 times, seven times, or 77 times, depending on how we translate that text in Matthew 18, you say you repent, you can be forgiven. Isn't that extraordinary? How gracious Jesus is? Look, I don't want to do something that dishonors him. I don't care how intense the urge if he came in the room right now and showed me his hands and his side, what am I going to do, sit in front of him? No, I'm going to be on my face. I'm going to be kissing his feet. I'm going to be washing his feet with my tears and wiping his feet with my hair because he did everything for me. He's not asking me to do so much. All he's asking me is to respond out of gratitude for the everything that he's done for me. And if we treat each other that way, recognizing that we all need to encourage one another in the Lord, and that none of us are excused from that obligation, and no exemption is given to radical discipleship, then I think we'll be on the correct page. Could you uh, read the question again, please? i got to find it first. Yeah. How do I... Here we go. How, do, uh, uh, how can our church be true to Scripture and still be loving to the LGBT community? How can our church be true to Scripture and still be loving to our LGBT community? Now it's my turn to go. Isn't that what my whole talk was about? Um, how bad a communicator must I be? Um, but this isn't about me. Um, it's not about me. Uh, it's about um, loving the LGBT community. Um, I, would, I have a, a, a couple of things that, um, that I'd say to that. Uh, one is uh, I'm reminded of by a conversation I had over the break, which is to say, um, as the church... Let's not be the ones that drive people away from Jesus and God. 
Um, this, is the, um, this has been the net effect of much of our traditional um, heterosexual normative uh, sort of conversation, um, not just because we're saying that uh, homose- heterosexuality is right, but because of the ways that we have uh, told people that God does not love them. Uh, whether that's been what we've said or whether that's been what, just what they've heard, um, it doesn't matter. Um, if we can't help LGBTQ people in our midst hear and know and experience that they're God's beloved children that we've failed. Um, how do you let somebody know that you love them? I've been in this sort of vortex answering that question, going around with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, who says very, very strong and strident and stringent things about what our ethics are supposed to be like. And at the heart of this, Jesus is hoping that the way that we act will show people what God is like. Let your light so shine before people that they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Don't just love your friends and hate your enemies, but be like God, your Father, who causes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike. There is a calling in the Sermon on the Mount that we so love our neighbors that they recognize the light and love of God in us, even if they don't agree with our theology. We don't get to tell somebody else that what I'm doing to you, not a grown human being who's not our children, we don't get to tell somebody else what I'm doing to you is love, even though you receive it as hate. When Jesus is confronted by Many, many, many people over the course of his ministry, he never does the bait and switch. He never says to somebody who comes up with a broken arm or bleeding, whatever, oh, what you really need is to have your relationship set right with God. Right? What it means to love our gay and lesbian sisters and brothers is to listen. What is your story? What do you need to be encouraged in the Lord? And where do I see that you need to be admonished to, to do better, to walk in the way of Jesus? What does it mean for me to love my gay and lesbian sisters and brothers? I've got one of my dear friends is a gay man who has covenanted himself to lifelong celibacy. What it means for me to love him is to do whatever I can to be part of the family that he's not going to have as through marriage or having children, to help make possible this beautifully impossible vow by which he's entrusted himself to God and to the community of Jesus followers. Um, I have two friends that got married two weekends ago, two women. How do I love them? I love them by helping them walk in the impossible road of daily cross-bearing, self-sacrificial love. That's the love of Christ for his church um, that Paul talks about in Ephesians 5. Laying down my life so that they can lay down theirs better for one another. Um, Loving them means loving them in ways that they know that they are loved. Okay. Last question since it's 12.05. And actually, I like this question because it kind of, in some ways, I think epitomizes both of your presentations. If it is wrong for us to continue to believe in what Paul said as a first century Jew, how then are we to believe that Scripture is God's inspired word for all times? Oh, wow. Yeah, this is, a, this is a great question. It comes down to really, I mean, it's part of this massive question, what is the Bible and what are we supposed to do with it? Um, we like simple answers to that question. The Bible is a rule book. It's the instruction manual for life. Um, but the Bible is actually a dynamic narrative. And what it means for us to treat the Bible as authoritative is not simply to um, read it, say what it says, do what it says, but to understand how this unfolding story envelops us in the time and the place where we are. In the words of Karl Barth, our job is not to say what the apostles and prophets said. Our job is to say what we must say on the basis of what the apostles and prophets said. How can I say that embracing gays and lesbians is a biblical position? Because the Bible shows us how to embrace in love people that God has embraced to God's self, even when the Bible might make us think that that's impossible. 
But the Bible shows us that it's not impossible, that the Spirit of God shows us who the children of God are. And when our gay sisters and brothers have the same spirit of adoption, crying out, Abba, Father, just like we do, that's us listening to Scripture and understanding that we are being shown who the people of God are, just like Paul looked at Scripture, but also looked at the work of the Spirit to identify this is who the people of God are. This is our narrative. It doesn't just um, tell us what to say like a script. It's a story that God is continuing to play out, and we have to figure out what does it look like to faithfully play out the story of Christ crucified and his self-giving love. We have to figure out how to play out this story of new creation and the surprises that come along when God says, I'm committed to this world, I'm redeeming it, and yet things are going to be different. And when God says, with this new creation, there's a new humanity in Christ. And with this new humanity in Christ, um, there is going to be a new way of being. So it is a completely um, biblical position that I'm, that I'm arguing for uh, as I suggest that we attend to the spirit and the ongoing work of God. Thank you. Rob? Well, I think it's a little easier than that. When you regard something that is regarded in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation as foundational for all sexual ethics as something that we can subvert at will in the church, irrespective of Jesus' view and in, irrespective of the priority that Jesus places on it, I think uh, we have done damage not only to the specific issue of how we deal with the question of homosexual practice, but any issue, any issue in ethics, any issue in doctrine. Uh, we simply don't care about the authority of Scripture. This has been the source of our problems to begin with, right? Is that historically, that when a church has wrestled with questions about how we should, what we should believe and how we should behave, this has always been determined with Scripture having the top priority, not just being in first place above a list, but way over everything else. And the degree to which something in Scripture is regarded as a core value is the degree to which you really got a tough case to override it or claim that the spirit is working at cross purposes with something that is clearly viewed as a core value from the beginning to the end of scripture and emphasized by Jesus and the apostolic witness to him. You got a real problem. Then after you deal with scripture, then you can consider other issues, like for example, philosophical reasoning, which may not give you scientific evidence, but it allows you to draw larger conclusions in life or scientific reasoning, where you could get evidence, but you might not have absolute answers from the evidence. Uh, and then finally, experience comes in. But experience is put last, not because it's not important, but because experience is not self-interpreting. You have to interpret your experience in light of those other lenses that we just mentioned. Otherwise, you can deceive yourself into thinking anything. But instead, what has happened in the church, instead of having that hermeneutical scale of priorities, if you will, we've completely inverted it on this issue. So at the top is experience as though it were self-interpreting, as though it didn't really need to consider Scripture's concerns, as though it really didn't need to consider these other concerns, just the way I view things. Now, you try to play, let's, let's take an analogy of you playing a card game. And one team says, yeah, let's have a priority of trumps. So the top trump will be spades, followed by, dime, followed by clubs, followed by diamonds, followed by hearts. So even, a, even an ace of hearts is trumped by a two of spades, okay? Because it's a priority of, of trumps. The other team says, great idea, but we have a different view of the priority of trumps. We're going to make hearts first, followed by diamonds, followed by clubs, followed by spades. Now try to play the game. Can't play the game. You haven't agreed on what takes priority. And that's what this discussion is about that you're having in this church. You're having a discussion about whether what Jesus thinks takes priority is to be given priority. You have a discussion about whether what Scripture as a whole, from Genesis through Revelation, including the whole apostolic witness to Jesus, including Paul, whether what that what is regarded as essential is to be viewed as essential anymore in the church. And if you don't think it is, then stop playing the game. Stop playing the game with Scripture. Stop making the pretense about the affirmation of Christ as Lord, because it is really Jesus who is Lord, 
your Lord. And you have used Jesus as a cipher into which you impute your own ideological meaning and make him say, like a marionette puppet, whatever you want him to say. But I suggest to you, that is not a good look for the church. And when the church does that, it ceases in any meaningful way to be a representative of the body of Christ in the world. And there are warnings in Revelation 2-3 by the risen Christ to such churches. You do not want to go down that route. Thank you. I think we've had an amazing presentation by two amazing speakers. Let's give them the round of applause. Okay, we're, we're finished, but I think Pastor Joyne has, you know, you, okay, here we go. Are we on? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless us in our doing and in our thinking. Bless us in our relationship to Scripture and our relationship to one another. Help us to be your people in this time and in this place following you. We ask it in your strong and wonderful name and all God's people said.